All right, fair enough. Thanks, Eric. So next up is the uh, the education program. So we're going to let uh, Aaron and Tony. Yep, I'll just be the one presenting. Okay. I just brought everybody else up here. That, so on the district, Fishery Supervisor, Southeast District, Jake and Jensen. And then we have Matthew Perry on who's not here as are the other three biologists in that office. And so we do the primary management up here at the lake and we'll continue to. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to come up here. And I'm just going to share a little bit of just a brief history of what we've done there and kind of some future manage management goals that we're going to go forward with as well as some uh, sedimentation stuff and then some vegetation stuff that we'll talk on too. So I don't know if we got to that'll work. So we all know here, you know, lake construction started that 08, 09, lake opened up to the public in 2012. And when that first opened up in, in 2010 and 2011, in brief history, we stocked bluegills, largemouth bass, black crappies. We stocked fingerling and advanced fingerling northern pike. So our fingerlings would have been one to two inches at that time in 2011, 2012. We, uh, just because we were nervous about the predation on those fish, we stocked, started stocking larger fish. Those would have been 13 inch fish. The walleye were similar in those beginning early stages. We can get away with stocking smaller fingerling walleyes when we don't have to worry about predation on them. Uh, from then on, starting in 2013, we started stocking advanced walleyes in there, which would be eight inch fish to avoid predation and, and hopefully increase survival. And then we also stocked blue catfish in 2011. So just so everybody knows, right? When, when a reservoir is built, there's a certain lifespan that's expected out of that reservoir. We're talking here at the Wahoo Creek once 100 year. I'm not for sure what Wahoo was ever pegged as since it's, it's more of a wetland reclamation project, but every lake has a certain lifespan. So on this, this is kind of busy. Uh, University of Nebraska published this uh, a few years ago, just talking about uh, reservoirs and, and how you look at quality versus the reservoir age and then implications down the road on, on being able to increase that quality. So we just look at this first graph. If you look at that first line where it says typical aging trajectory, right? So as that reservoir begins, those first few years are going to be the, the years when it's most productive. When that stuff is newly flooded, we get a big increase in uh, nutrients. Fish growth is usually at its apex. Vegetation growth is usually at its apex. Water quality is still really good. And then there's certain things on that decline, as you see as it goes down and the reservoir gets older, there's certain things in that process that can either speed that up and make that slow faster, or we could slow it down, right? So we do things like sedimentation structures up above the reservoir to hopefully increase that, that quality. Um, some things that can decrease it, major floods, introduced species that we don't want in there. Um, could be a lot of different things, but, but, you know, right now we're kind of, we were at that peak those first few years, you know, you think back to 2013, 2014 at the lake, fishing was really good We had good water quality. And then a few things have happened. So, you know, when we, when we look at it, some of the things that could be weather events, you know, I think back of the, the 2014 and the 2019 uh, rainfall events, uh, I can remember sitting up on the dam in 2014 and watching, you could just see crappies coming over the spillway and going down over the weir structure, you know, and so stuff like that can impact it. 2019 was probably a little bit different impact where, uh, you know, when the ground was froze and we had all that flow going through all parts of Northeast Nebraska, just the amount of, of collection of things that was getting pushed down that watershed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where it slows up is in our reservoir systems. And so that's where a lot of that deposition is. So we can have issues with sedimentation, stuff like that. So again, can impact water quality, can impact vegetation at certain times of the year, whether that be flooding it out 
and decrease in the water clarity where we we kill the vegetation or could be enough flow where we completely remove vegetation and probably the biggest thing is and, and this has been shown uh, in reservoirs the, the number one thing that shows that decline over time is sedimentation right we, we lose a lot of that really good soil we start impact and silt you know and then we the biggest thing with this uh, especially on something like this where you got highly erodible soils in the watershed is that can get then resuspended a lot easier and so then you start seeing seeing water quality declines a few other things that are particular out here would be introduction of unwanted species so common carp would be probably number one and it's and it's an issue we deal with across the state out here we first seen common carp in our trap nets when we were doing our northern pike sampling in 2016. I think we got two of them that were this big. And so you can see on the graph there, 2018, we started catching them in our gill nets. Uh, and then we saw that big peak. And that's when those fish were at their perfect sizes for us to capture in our gill nets. You can see here, it looks like there's been a decline probably in the carp numbers. I don't think that's true. I think the sizes of those carp have just increased to where we're not effectively catching them. Our gill nets have different mesh sizes, anywhere from a quarter inch all the way up to two inches. And so if a fish gets too big, it just, we don't see as many. So what we kind of have out there now is still a pretty high density carp uh, fishery, but large sizes. So a lot of fish over 20 inches. And if you've been out there on a summer day the last few years, you'd, you'd see them. These things reduce vegetation growth, so they get up in, especially in the spring when they're spawning, they get up in there, they'll uproot vegetation while they're feeding and spawning. That in turn can contribute to declines in water quality, which we've seen. If you lose the water quality and the water clarity, that again can in turn lead to those declines in vegetation because we don't get sun penetration down into the seed bank. And probably the biggest thing is they tie up a lot of biomass in our systems. So a lot of these where we do a full lake renovation, we see total biomass estimates of somewhere between 80 to 90 percent. Right. So if you're thinking in terms of like a cornfield, a lake can support a certain amount of biomass of fish. OK, just like an acre of ground out here can support a certain amount of row crop in it. Carp would kind of be like not treating weeds. Right. So if you if you start pushing that biomass or that nutrients to something else, you're going to have less yield. It's the same thing that we see in a fisheries. The more we have of our one unwanted fish species, the more it's going to have an impact on the fish we do want, especially when these are some of the largest fish in the, in the lake too. Another unwanted fish species that we sampled a couple of years ago would be gizzard shad. And so um, typically, these aren't something that come in from the watershed. You know, the carp, like we can only suspect, maybe it came in from the watershed. People do use them for bait at smaller, smaller sizes. Gizzard shad typically uh, in our, you don't find them in a lot of small reservoirs, especially up in this watershed, really anywhere. <clears throat> so my guess would be after 10 years, somebody probably brought them in for bait at some point and used them and, and they were released. Um, the issue with gizzard shad in small reservoirs, you think in our large reservoirs like Calamus and Harlan, they're pretty productive in those systems because we're managing for more predator fish, walleyes, wipers, white bass, stuff that's going to directly feed on the gizzard shad. Whereas you think about Lake Wanahoo, where it's been management more for our panfish and bass, our bluegills, crappies, bass, they have direct competition with those fish. So it's small small sizes are all eating zooplankton and uh gizzard shad it's just more competition that those fish have right you have a certain amount of resources out there the more fish you got to share it with the less it is for everybody uh, there's been also a lot of stuff uh, in the research looking at declines in water quality on these again specifically to these more smaller reservoirs but they just resuspend sediment the one good thing is and they can provide a prey base to our large predator fish. So our walleyes out there right now will probably benefit because of this, a few others. So getting on with the game fish, I'm just gonna give a brief 10 year kind of idea of what we've had out there. Our bluegills, we've had this reduced density over time. Uh, other than those first few years, we have, 
we haven't really been consistent in sampling them. I think it, a lot of it is, is we have so much offshore habitat at Wanahoo compared to a, our, a lot of our other Salt Valley lakes with the trees and some of the shallow water in the trees. But you can see we've been pretty consistent over the eight years. I would expect the densities and the growth of those fish to continue to decline as we lose water quality and vegetation. Bluegills are uh, eat a lot of bugs. A lot of those bugs you don't get unless you have a good vegetation stand and they like clear water. And so when you when you reduce vegetation, you reduce water quality or clarity, where bluegills are gonna probably be the ones that suffer the most um, from those gizzard chad and, and common carp coming into the reservoir. Our largemouth bass, again, we see that reduced density over the last 10 years. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's all bad. I think some of this in the, you can see in 19, 20 and 21, we kind of had a little drop. I think some of that is, is due to the uh, water quality that we see in the spring compared to what it was. When we're sampling these, we're using electro fishing gear. So if the water's really clear, you can see basically everything that's that you're shocking and netting, right? We've seen that decline in water clarity over time. So I think our densities are still right around probably that 150 to 200 and they're maintaining. And, you know, we have that lower density, but we are seeing a higher size structure. So we're seeing quite a few fish over that 15. Again, these are going to be, have a negative impact by the carp <laughs> just because of the water quality issues and vegetation issues and probably a mixed impact with the gizzard chad. At small ages, they're going to be in direct competition with those fish. Once they get large enough to eat gizzard chad, then they're going to benefit from that because it's a really good food source for them. However, you are also going to probably see declines in catch rates come that August, September time frame. When gizzard shad spawn, they spawn in July, and that's when you're going to see that really switch to a gizzard shad prey base. And typically, then you, you we see catch rates decline. We see it with walleye, a lot of other species across the state. So black crappie, they've remained relatively consistent. I would say they're probably the number one fish species out here. A lot of guys are targeting that and bass. They're cyclical spawners. So you can see here that 2012, 13, where the red is, those are big small fish, less than five inches. So that kind of is our, our index of what we're seeing for recruitment into the system. You can see the years following then, once we have that big spawn cycle, then we see a few two to three years where they're not having much for, for uh, spawn. We get growth rates. Fishermen usually bring that down. And then every three to four years, we see another year class. So it looks pretty good here, kind of seeing the same thing. Growth is slowed, but then this last spring, so those numbers haven't changed from this previous graph. The last spring when we were out there doing a bluegill survey, that's what we had in for crappie. But we went from 100 fish per net up to 600 fish per net. So um, that 2018 year class, although it wasn't represented really well on the catch rates, uh, looked to be really, really successful. The issue we're dealing with now is probably we got too many crappies out there. And so growth is slowed. We got a lot of fish in that nine to nine and a half inch range, and they're not putting on a growth because the densities are so high. So something we're gonna talk about at, at our public fisheries meeting is maybe uh, figuring out a way to get information out to the public on some of these lakes where, because this one who's not the only lake we deal with this issue, but trying to get something out to our anglers to say, hey, if you're looking, you know, you want to have a fish fry, you're looking for high catch rates. Yeah, that might not be 12 inch or 13 inch fish you're going to be catching. But if you want to go out there and catch some crappies, these would be some lakes to target. And, and Wanahoo is definitely going to be one of those that we would promote in that, uh, that section. So Northern Pike was a really popular fish species when we introduced it. Uh, we kind of knew right away this was probably going to be for a certain amount of time. We are definitely not in northern pike habitat in southeast Nebraska, but we can capitalize on some of these new reservoirs, you know, you, where I showed you that peak. Some of that is we can support cold water fish for a while. And so this was kind of an a introduction back into it. And we monitored the snot out of these things, have really good data on it. So. You see on the left side, on the y-axis, population estimates, 
and it's not an actual population estimate of the whole lake. The way the models work, it's a population estimate of the, uh, what was the language, Tony? The spawning fish. Yeah, spawning fish is, is basically, so it's, it's basically a population estimate of the fish that are in the northern half of the lake in the spring. And we use it more as an index to look at every year to track that over time. And you can see here uh, the latest stuff from 2023, Jake, was what, 200 and some fish? 219. 219 fish. So, you know, we went from a peak of about 2,200 at the beginning of the reservoir, pretty good decline. 2014 does look like it was low there. That was a year we sampled and the weather was brutal and icy and the water water uh, temperature dipped a lot. We we just had low catch rates. So I think it's a pretty good decline. How big are those northerns? Uh, we had fish multiple fish over 40 inches. So the, the the give and take on some of that, we're not in northern pike habitat, right? But if you're if you're looking at northern species and you start pushing them south, your life expectancy on those fish declines, but the growth rates increase dramatically from like what you would see up in Canada, say. You know, what we're seeing in two years growth down here is probably what they're seeing in seven to eight years growth up in Canada. So it's 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 kind of the give and take, just as you take fish from the south and you move them north, our growth rates decline and they live longer. So, what, but do, does it also change the reproductivity of the uh, of the fish as far as they do they re spawn sooner as they're since they're growing faster but living a shorter life? Are we do they spawn sooner in age or are they still yeah biology is biology and they only mm -hmm. No, we would see an, uh, a lower age and sexual maturity on okay. these fish too. A lot of that's based on some on growth and, and what they have for availability. Um, we were seeing fish that were sexually mature after two years okay. down here. But now, turbidity in this water is not favorable. I mean, but you've already we already know that this is not pike country. I grew up in pike country. Yep. So what what becomes the next apex predator to since we have turbid water conditions? Yeah, so. and we'll get to that. So um, I'm going to kind of talk about our stocking plans here for the next upcoming years too, and I'll, I'll touch base on that. It's a good question. And we never did see any natural recruitment out here. Um, they went through the process for sure, but um, we never documented any actual natural reproduction. And so if there was some, I wouldn't say that there absolutely wasn't, but it was never enough to maintain a fishery. The fishery was always maintained through stocking. So again, we've seen in the last few years, we've also seen a decrease in the size structure. Uh, those older fish um, from those beginning year classes are starting to die off. And so with that, now we're starting to see that decline, you know, in, in our larger fish. And again, it's not surprising. We, we expected it maybe not to go as fast as it did, but we knew this wasn't going to be something that we were going to be able to sustain for 20 years either. Walleyes, which are kind of king, across the state and across the Midwest. Uh, they've been relatively consistent. Some of this is probably due to us switching stocking strategies and, and putting in eight inch fish instead of fingerling fish, uh, especially at the peak of our bass. You know, you, you're basically just feeding bass if you're stocking fingerling walleyes or fingerling anything when bass densities are as high as what they were. Uh, we do see a large size structure, you know, you can see the blue bars on there are fish that we sample greater than 25 inches. So uh, it is probably the one, one of the better lakes in the district where we see some of those larger fish present almost every time. And these will probably have a likely positive impact from the shad. One, we're stocking those larger fish. They're available to get on those shad right away. And the adult fish in there will, will feed pretty heavy on the shad also. So the blue catfish, this is something that's come up. I don't know how anybody's familiar with the whole thing that went on out there. Uh, we stocked almost 55,000 blue catfish out there thinking this was going to be a unique fishery. It was going to be, you know, it's set up nice with the creek channel and the flooded timber, things that, that blue catfish really seemed to like. And we never sampled a blue catfish out there. And all the nets and all the electro fishing, everything, never sampled a single blue catfish. So what happened to them? I'm not for sure. They either just didn't take 
or they were flushed out. I mean, I, we probably a combination of both. Um, we had a few anglers that would call in and say they caught a blue catfish. We'd automatically say, hey, do you have it still or do you have a picture of it? The answer was always no. So, <laughs> so we never ever, I never did confirm. I've never seen anybody or if anybody ever knows anybody that would, that thinks they caught a blue catfish and have some photo evidence, I'd love to see it. But as far as we know, uh, they didn't do well. So, so kind of going into the future, and I won't take up too much time here. Uh, we're going to try to concentrate more on walleyes for our for one of our apex predators. So again, we're going to continue to stock those advanced fish in the fall, those eight inch fish. Uh, they have a high survivability, and they seem to be doing well at a lot of our lakes in the district. But we're also going to, now that our bass density is declining a little bit, we're going to try to take advantage of that. Uh, this last year, I stocked fingerling walleyes. We're going to continue doing that. And hopefully we'll get a, another boost on top of that and we can see those walleye numbers go up. The northern pike stockings, we're going to cut the northern pike stockings. Uh, we are going to sample again for the last time this spring, just in case something wild happens that we don't expect. I would expect our, our population estimate to be similar to what it was this last year, um, but we will be we will be out there here in a couple of weeks. If anybody's interested in tagging along and northern pike sampling, let me know. Uh, we will be getting a sign up up. If we do this, we do it at two lakes here and at Flanagan Lake in Omaha, um, and we typically have around what Jake sixty to seventy volunteers that come out and help us do it. And so if anybody's ever interested in hopping on a boat and seeing what a fishery biologist does, uh, get a hold of me. We're going to start stocking channel catfish. We, we kind of avoided it from the beginning just because we didn't, you don't want to throw too much at, at the lake right away. And yet sometimes you end up with a whole lot of nothing. And channel catfish we knew would come into the system through the ponds above at just slow rate. So there'd be the opportunity. And there is, and we're seeing some more catfish out here every year. Um, but we kind of in place a little bit of the northern pike now. Um, we are going to start stocking channel catfish out there. Another thing we're going to try this year is wiper stockings. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with wipers. It's 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 a hybrid. It's a hybrid between a striped bass and a white bass. So it depends on where you're at. But the issue sometimes out here is in the dead of summer, in those July, August, September time frame, the fishery out here is pretty tough, or it can be pretty tough. One, we got our gizzard chad that are spawning, and so catch rates on those large predator fish is already kind of at a decline. Mm -hmm. The wipers feed heavily on gizzard chad that time of the year and, and can provide across the state, when we look at Harlan and Calamus, they provide a real driving force for anglers to get out there. Um, these things that chase gizzard chad on the surface, they can be pretty easy to find at times and they fight like a son of a gun. And so um, trying to get something in there to drive that, that fisheries participation throughout the summer, um, we're gonna try wipers and see if they see if they stick. Being a hybrid, they're sterile fish. So they they are, they can they've been found to to cross breed back with the parent species, but we won't have any of those parent species in there, just wipers. What about saw guys? So saw guys would be, right now we're still seeing pretty decent numbers on the walleyes. So we, in the district, we, we stock both saw guys and walleyes. Okay. And we've seen in the lakes that we've sampled, we've, the, the catch rates are pretty similar across the two species. We are seeing a slight increase in our growth rates in our saw guys. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not that's 100% true or if it's maybe a bias on some of the, the lakes that we're stocking them at, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's something that we've talked about internally is, is trying saw guys at some of these lakes too, if our walleye numbers that we're, that we're stocking these advanced fish aren't showing through. So saw guys, Saw guys, because of their parent hybrid with a sauger, they're thought to do better in more turbid water. They grew up in the, you know, native around here in the in the Missouri and the Platte River, which back in that day were shallow, turbid rivers. And so 
Um, there's some thought behind that, that in the more turbid areas, saw guys might be better. So again, what about recreating artificial vegetation out there to, I mean, we're losing, we're losing vegetation or getting turbidity in our water. Yeah. What do we besides putting in another apex predator to eat the problem? What do we do to regrow, regain the, bio, the, the plant growth? The plant yeah. Get it back to that like it was. Yeah, some of that closer to the yeah. Closer. Some of that's tough if your water quality. If you can't increase your water clarity, just because you need that sun penetration, right. the seed bank is all there. Right. And a lot of it is with the carp. Once you know that stuff's going to grow every year. Right. The problem is, is it just it's like a lawnmower. It down. You know, it's like a lawnmower all the way across there. And as those densities go up, that's the issue that you cause. You know the. The, the number one thing that we usually do in these situations would be a full lake renovation. I don't think we're to that where we would no. kill off the whole okay. fishery. And we're not to the point up here to doing that yet. That's why we're gonna try some new things. Um, but down the road, that might be a possibility. And I wouldn't rule it out. We've tried other vegetation plantings out there. Mm -hmm. We've tried saplings, we've tried cattails. I don't know what else did we try anything else, Tony? And and none of them really took. And, and some of it is too the on those new plantings, the wind erosion on some of those bank lines just tear it out. So it's hard to get it established unless it's natural. And once you have common carp in there, it's hard to flip the state back to a yep. clear water vegetated. Yeah. Um, the only time we do that is through a full lake renovation, right. really. So, um, real quick. We, we did a sedimentation analysis out there this last summer. Um, it kind of all started, again, we've, we've monitored those northern pike since the inception of the lake. And we've been up there in the northern half running trap nets in the spring, usually in March. And we started to notice pretty shallow depths over time, right? We're, we're getting up there, we're having a harder time getting around in boats. We're having a harder time setting nets where we first did. And then it was pretty significant in areas. Uh, mainly in the creek channel uh, was probably the, the biggest area where I noticed it. And so we kind of just started thinking, you know, God, it'd be good I, good to know how much sediment's accumulated, where it's accumulating, just to start tracking this over time so we got some baseline data on it. So last year we mapped the entire lake uh, with a few different boats. Uh, it's really not that hard with the collection process anymore uh, with a decent depth finder. And then Jensen was kind of our lead on it, working in GIS and looking at some of this stuff. But what we did is we created a historic map. So essentially we recreated that, that map that was the first bathymetric map when the lake opened that the consultants uh, gave us, right? And then we did a current map. So the, the bathymetric data that we just collected last year. We also did a comparison of the stage storage table so we could look at the amount of uh, volume lost in the lake or however you want to do it, volume lost or the, the volume of accumulated sediment. And then we we created a, a gain loss map for a visual representation so we could kind of see those areas where more siltation has occurred compared to others. So these would be the two maps, the historic on the left, the current on the right. It's hard to tell at this point. Uh, the main lake, you can kind of still see the creek channel running through but what I really want to focus on is this northern half. So you can see that creek channel is really well defined on that historic map. And on the current map, um, it's basically gone up on that upper end. The other thing, if you look right up in the in the top middle, there was a big area, we called it the V. It was a big area of uh, excavation when the lake was built at depths of about 10 feet in there with one where we caught a lot of northern pike. And you can see that's now about four foot across that whole thing. And so pretty, pretty big sedimentation issues. When we look at that gain loss map, the red and dark red would indicate areas of, of sedimentation that are filling in. You can see that that minus 10. So in that creek channel, we've had areas of over 10 foot of deposition. Wow. So areas where where I remember when I first started with the game and parks, the creek channel is about 13 to 14 feet all the way up that. This last year, I set trap nets in the creek channel in two and a half feet of water. And so 
So there's some there's some big deposition going in on that first that first little stretch, and it starts there a little bit south of Pork Chop Island. You can also see that area of the V. It looks to me anyway like that water's getting pushed out of that creek channel to the east, and it's starting to fill in that that V section. Any areas that we basically any areas that we deepened at the very beginning, which you would expect, those are the ones that are first accumulating. They're the, they're the lowest level, um, but some major issues. So this would be, yeah, I have a question. yep. So on the very north end, don't they have those areas where you trap sediment in? Yep. Are those full or are they not what we can? We didn't get up above there. I, I would expect you're gonna see pretty similar things as you go north into the sediment basin. I mean, it, mm -hmm. So typically when we're, and you, you can't always be choosy on these things, but what you what we really look for in a watershed to lake, lake acreage ratio would be in that 15 or 30 to one, right? So if you extrapolate that out, Wanahoo is 87 to one. And so it's got a big watershed. Um, the, it's got highly erodible soil up above. It's a lot of lows and, and it, uh, there's a lot of uh, straightening in those creek channels too above it. And so when you do get those big rain events, it just, it creates that uh, real fast moving water, moves a lot of sediment. And, you know, I can just tell you from, a, from my perspective, when we drive up into that very upper end, I would expect in those first weirs above, it's, it's probably getting pretty full too. That probably has enough velocity in some of those areas that it's, staying maintained a little better it's just like the upper end of the of the creek here that's still maintained a little depth because it's it's got high banks on both sides so when the water does go it's got enough velocity to push it through it's just depositing down there further once the water slows so that's down up a foot a year in sediment places yeah we'll we'll get to it here was there any data in between the four and prior to 19 we didn't have any depth of the sediment. No, and I wish, you know, really, to be honest, I didn't have the capabilities. I didn't know how to do it. I'm not a GIS person. I could I could have collected the data, but after Jensen got here and, and he, he had a background of it, so I'm like, let's start doing this stuff, you know, more district-wide. So, yeah, so you see, I wish we would have had it, you know, every two years or even three years just to track this over time. Uh, again, you look at the the main lake. the The main point is there's a lot of pinks, there's a lot of reds on the west side where we had the deepest excavation. Obviously, that's going to be the stuff that's going to catch the sediment probably first, as it's both catching sediment and then also just sloughing off. Right? We had pretty steep excavation banks on there. That's going to start sloughing off over time, as expected. The green and the trees. So that would be like areas that were deeper than are on the original plants. Now, whether that's a collection error, it's hard to drive a boat through those trees and get good, accurate soundings. But I also don't know on how they created that first map, how well they got in there, or if it was just on LIDAR, or if they just took a couple points and then extrapolated it across where, you know, really we had a bunch of dips and humps and it was, Put on the map is just kind of flat but there was also areas like this on the original map um, in that upper end this would be in those cat paws on the west side on the original map it just had a slight taper all the way out to the trees well, in reality there was a bunch of excavation right on that shoreline that never made it into that original map and so when we first saw this, I thought, what the heck is going on here? It says we had, you know, eight foot of deepening along that shoreline. Well, it had been there the whole time. It just wasn't on that original bathymetric map. So so there's some of that, too. I'm going to add in just for a quick second here. So to add the collection areas of the trees. So when you're sounding depth, you can be bouncing it off the trees, getting inaccurate depths that way, right? And so that's where you see a little bit of inaccuracy there. Um, again, comparing it to the old, we don't know how the old was collected. So uh, it does a really good job. Um, it's basically an algorithm that guesses between points. So you drive back and forth throughout the whole lake, say you have a, just a uniform bowl, it's going to really do a good job if there's no obstructions saying between point A and point B, I can guess that depth. 
obviously the more points you collect, the more accurate it is. It's hard to drive really tight transects through those trees. We did a really good job. You can see, especially in the open water areas, how accurate it is. Um, but that just adds a little yeah. bit of inaccuracy when, when you're collecting. But it did a pretty good job. Yeah. So when we start actually putting numbers to it, based off of what we, we mapped and what was there, we've lost about 813 acre feet, 11% throughout the whole year. So roughly 1% a year. And looking at some other data, we had some stuff done at East Twin here a couple of years ago, west of town, and that was at, they were at 0.97% a year. Um, that thing is about 50% filled up and it's 50 years old. So it's similar. The issue that we run into probably here, mm -hmm. You know, the south end is maintained pretty decent, 7% loss, 415 acre feet. It's the north end that really took the brunt of it, which we would expect, right? You got that, you got the whole uh, breakwater that's going across the lake that's slowing water down. Anytime you slow water down, sediment, sediment's going to deposit. And especially when it's coming in on that creek channel, and it's once it gets to a certain area and that velocity slows down, it's just going to fall out. Now, over time, it just keeps pushing that down the reservoir. But you can see there, 27% uh, loss, so almost 2% a year up in that upper end. So pretty significant. And, and our one of our guys from Nebraska land was just flying one of the days. And this was one of the pictures. I We use this picture a lot when we're talking about like sedimentation and eutrophication in Nebraska, because this is like the epitome picture of, of what it looks like from the sky. So it's kind of neat to see it. Again, Creek Channel has areas with over 10 feet of deposition in it. And that's not just one small little area. It's a lot of that middle section of the creek. So one last thing I'm just going to briefly touch on, uh, American Lotus. So Lotus is a, it's a native species. It spreads through rhizomes on the bottom of the lake. And it can spread pretty rapidly in shallow areas. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with what I'm going to be talking about here, but um, I noticed a lot this year, it can really limit access and be a boating hazard. The, the stems, the, the plant material, a lot of it breaks down in the winter. The stems will stay in the water and it's like driving over rope in your boat prop. So you're constantly getting out and having to clean that. When we're driving for Northern Pike sampling and you're going up and down in those areas, Every single day, you're getting out of the boat, putting the motor up, getting there, cleaning it off to go again. But we've we've had aerial imagery off this from from Nebraska land for a few years, and so I just want to show it. It's a lot better visually. You can see the spot there, uh, be just west, just below Fork Chop Island. There's a little few dots right there in that area, mm -hmm. and that's the lotus. I don't I have no idea where that seed bank it came from. If it was around there before the lake even filled up, if there was a small wetland that had lotus in it beforehand, I don't know, but it was there in 13. In 2014, you can see it there, we got actually an angler that's fishing through it. And so it's spreading a little bit, but 14 to 16, you can see the jump there and the increase in the amount of lotus. So it's starting to expand and that whole area there is pretty similar depths. It's about four to five feet by 2020. You can see, and on the very left-hand side, it's starting to reach into there. If, if you look here, I'm going to go back here. You can see on the upper edge of that, that creek channel is still deep enough. The lotus isn't going through it. By 2020, the lotus is spreading across that creek channel. So what we had for some, some sort of containment in there and boat passage is gone. And we didn't have a recent imagery, but this was from Google Earth. The outlined in red is where it was at in the spring of 22, the, the seed bank. And so um, it's starting to really push up that upper end. Soon it's going to be all the way to the west. The bigger concern is probably around Pork Chop. I know we have, you guys have the campground that's up there on Pork Chop Island. But just because of those boating concerns, that's probably my bigger issue. It can be treated with herbicide. So... 2,4-D or glyphosate, some aquatic glyphosate will kill it. It doesn't kill it for good. 
Iowa's dealing with this a lot. We just had a meeting, uh, Carter Lake, which is a lake that we co-manage with, with Iowa DNR, has some pretty serious lotus problems. So do some other lakes in Iowa. What I heard from them, because we don't treat it in Nebraska, it's a native species, and we've had issues even, you know, we can't spend any federal money treating it right now. Um, but what they've told me is treating it from a boat, you're kind of wasting your money. One, you can't, unless you, 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 if you have a prop boat, you can't drive through it effectively. You constantly are stirring up water and mud and you're splashing it on the leaves, which then your treatment goes down. So what they've been doing the last few years was airboats. And even with an airboat, you got to hit it about twice, but it limits the uh, amount that you're getting stuck so you can broadcast it. But now they're going drones. So Iowa treats it differently. Iowa, Iowa's DNR has a separate fund for aquatic vegetation control. We don't have that through Game and Parks. But they, they hire a lot of that out through a company. I think it's called Aquatic Control. Aquatic Control just finally got a drone in their area. So now they're going to try to start treating it with, with a drone. So we'll see if it's effective. Again, not the biggest concern. I just wanted to make everybody aware of it that, you know, if, if we're worried or if you guys are worried about that campground or anything on Pork Chop Island, probably in the next 10 years, if you got a prop boat, you're going to have issues getting to and from it because I you're going to start running into those stems and so, it's kind of a pain in the butt. So, so you're saying since it's native to this area, we can't take funds in 86? Yeah, I mean, the, what's the legality yeah. of this? No, you can't. I mean, this is. It, it, it would be considered like a nuisance in this yeah. case where where uh, yeah. if you are wanting folks to still get to your campground on the island that you could treat it. Yeah. You could treat it. It's one of those things from our stance. We we have to prioritize where we're going to treat the vegetation. Right. We we prioritize towards aquatic invasive species, um, invasive vegetation. Um, so that's been our stance so far. But it's one of those things too, like Aaron talked about, we've had this major lack of vegetation in the reservoir so this lotus um it it is good fish habitat it's right. not the best but the accessibility for anglers folks getting places it, that's probably the major issue it's it it's perfectly fine for the fishery and the biotic community there it so. probably has some benefit now albeit i don't know what it is but it probably has some benefit for slowing water down too during high water right, events it so holds back some of the turbidity and yeah you know you think about it like a tree line on a on a creek bed or vegetation on a creek bed the more you have to control that and hold that together so it's not all bad i just i just put it up here so everybody was aware of it and go from there so that's that's all i got are there any things about one who that make it unique in terms of being able to predict and plan down the road, or is it a pretty standard? We kind of can see where things are going to go in management of this. Or are there unique things that make it more difficult here? Well, one unique thing management wise, and, and again, we're not there yet, but renovations, it's watershed is really big. So it's it's a little unique in that factor that the planning process for something like that is very, very challenging. Because typically when we do full lake renovations, we we look at the entire watershed. We look at every single pond in the watershed. You know, it, there's carp somewhere. So we're gonna do the renovation. We wanna get the dang things out of the entire watershed. So it's a little unique in that factor. Um, it is also unique in this one, just because of the weir structure for for water level maintenance. It's It's a little bit more stable then maybe some of the other lakes that we have where, you know, on the on our actual flood control reservoirs where you can get that pulse and slow down. We don't have to worry about that. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Or we are such a larger watershed. Yeah. And so it's good and bad. I don't know if it's challenging or unique, but sometimes on those we do get fish kills because of that. Water level will increase. Vegetation around the lake will flood and die back when that dies back. The bacteria starts using oxygen cons to consume that plant material. You get big sags, you get fish kills. So, um, you know, it, it it's kind of had that peak. The carp and gizzard shad are probably my biggest concern. The carp, 
by far the most, just because of the impacts that we see across the state by common car. We know, we kind of know what's going to happen. You know, you can kind of start to map things out. And this was that you've aggressively put the wipers in. What kind of decrease over time do you see in those carp and shad populations? Yeah. Not much. They're, you're not going to get really, really for carp and gizzard shad. There's really no biological controls. You could put all the mount. We've tried it at multiple lakes. Okay. The, the amount that you would need to remove. So UNL did some work on some, for white perch and gizzard shad with us here a few years ago, Pawnee. Basically, in order to control that species, you need to remove 80% of those fish every single year. Every year. And so like at Pawnee, which is, you know, it's a little bit bigger. There was almost 2 million white perch that were living in there living that in were there. predicted. So, so you think about the amount of fish that would either need to be consumed or removed. That's a pretty tall task. Yeah. So it's, it's more, it's, it's more taking advantage of, of what's in there and trying to make something that's really not great for everything else, at least try to use it to your benefit and right. provide a fishery. So that's why we're going that way. We're going to try to, it, we don't know if they'll stick or not. So we'll, we'll put them in, we'll monitor and we'll go from there. This is Tom. I have a question. Are, are we dealing two questions? Are we dealing with zebra mussels and what's the budget for our NRD for your work? Thank you. No, no zebra mussels as of now. So we, this is a lake. We, we villager sample. Villagers are basically the microscopic zebra mussels. We do villager sampling out here every year. Um, we also do a little bit of looking around for any adult zebra mussels on rocks and stuff like that. We have a, we have an AIS coordinator now. So he does that. So far, no threat of zebra mussels, although we're surrounded in Nebraska by states that have zebra mussel issues. So we're we're doing our best. And so far, we've been one of the only states that have been able to, to really keep them at bay. So and then as far as what's the NRD, what's the NRD paying for your services yearly? Yeah, so I'll address that. Um the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, um, we are tasked with managing the aquatic resources and fisheries of the state. So we come in, we we uh, we manage fisheries, we stock fisheries statewide, whether it's uh, whether it's on Game and Parks property, NRDs, cities, um, public power and irrigation districts. The fisheries management is taken care of by us, and so. That's uh, that's taken up care of within our own operational budget. So um, there's really no exchange of funds when it comes to that. Okay. Any yeah. other questions before? Aaron Luce, thank you very much. Yeah. For yep. Thank you.